What do you think, Raj? We feeling pretty good here? I think we're good. We're, we're at 107. And counting. It keeps jumping. That's great. <clears throat> good to see uh, the numbers here. And uh, I guess we'll jump right in here. So I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Kevin Cavanaugh. I'm the Executive Director of Massachusetts Hockey and uh, responsible kind of for overseeing some of the day-to-day -day business operations and working with our uh, great group of volunteer leaders. Um, we wish that we could uh, see each and every one of you in the rink this year, obviously, but uh, given the circumstances, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. And uh, while, while it's frustrating uh, for all of us, I'm sure we're, we love being in the rink and hockey is an important part of all of our lives. I think it's also a good lesson here uh, at this point to kind of realize that sometimes things are outside of our control. And uh, how we handle situations is, uh, is a little bit of what makes us who we are. Uh, so clearly, you know, the, the COVID-19 crisis that we're all faced with right now is a situation that uh, none of us have any control over, uh, but here we are. And it's a credit to each and every one of you that took the time tonight to, to put your school aside for a little bit, your family aside, or your uh, Fortnite or whatever else might be going on out there, and uh, to take maybe an hour or so to, to listen to some hockey talk. And um, we're excited to give you an opportunity to ask a few questions throughout the evening here as well. So hopefully you take some of the information uh, that's presented here tonight, use it to help make you a better hockey player. Uh, we got a great panel uh, that we're excited to work with and have you listen to tonight. Uh, so I'll start just introducing a, a few people to you. Uh, Roger Grillo. Roger's the uh, regional manager for USA Hockey's American Development Model. And he's a longtime uh, NCAA Division I coach, uh, including spending time at UVM where he coached uh, players like Tim Thomas and Martin San Louis. And he also spent 12 years as the head coach at Brown University. Uh, Paul Pearl is the associate head coach at BU. And uh, before that, he was at Harvard and head coach at Holy Cross. Uh, he's the director for the Massachusetts CCM High Performance Program. Uh, the best way to put it is that Paul is uh, the guy that picks the guys who pick you. So all the evaluators uh, are people that Paul puts in place for each of the age groups. And uh, ultimately, he's responsible for uh, the overall functionality of the program. Uh, Brian Robinson, he's the goaltending coach at Harvard University, and he's the goalie director for the Massachusetts CCM High Performance Program. Uh, best way to put it, he's the Paul Pearl of our goalies. So again, he puts the evaluating staff together and uh, is ultimately responsible for helping us uh, determine the goaltenders that move on to the National Development Camp. Uh, Two other people uh, on the call that I'd uh, be remiss if I didn't include. Uh, Liz Cohen is Director of Communications uh, for Massachusetts Hockey and has done a lot of the legwork to help get the technology set up for us here. And she's in charge of all the Zoom calls and all the emails that you get from Mass Hockey. She does a great job, so thanks for her support. Um, and uh, importantly as well, Steve Rizzo. Uh, Steve is a Vice President for Massachusetts Hockey. He's a USA Hockey Board of Directors member and he's the chair of the Player Development Committee that oversees this entire process. Uh, Steve has worked a large number of national development camps over the years and uh, definitely is one of the people that USA Hockey counts on to make sure that those national development camps are the best that they can be and run smooth uh, and seamlessly. So uh, last but not least, before I hand it over to Roger, I just want to thank CCM uh, for their great partnership in the high performance program that we run. Uh, a lot of the opportunities that are presented uh, are part of our relationship with CCM, and we're thrilled that we are able to uh, have a great partnership and relationship with them. So uh, thank you to CCM for making a lot of this possible. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Roger Grillo. Kevin, thank you very much. And, and certainly uh, want to welcome all the parents, the players, and coaches to tonight's call. Um, and uh, hopefully we can give you guys some information that you can take forward and and help uh, with uh, choices and, and, and player development uh, uh, philosophies and ideas that uh, will help you down the path uh, as, a, as a player. Um, on behalf of USA Hockey, I'd like to, to also uh, hope that all of your families and, and friends are doing well through this hard time. I know we all miss being at the rink and, and we look for, uh, forward to the day that we're gonna be able to back and, and be at the, uh, on the ice and, and working with uh, the athletes that are here tonight. I also want to thank Mass Hockey and and uh, the leadership there and all of the, the great volunteers that they have that help our the great sport go here in the state of Massachusetts and and a big thank you to the two gentlemen that are on the call tonight with us that are in charge of player development. It's a it's a big part of of uh, what we're trying to do across the country and Massachusetts with the.
the excellent uh, staff that we have in place right now with Paul and, and Brian and then the people that work with them uh, is certainly one of the best groups we have in the country. And, and we're really honored to have them be a part of this. So uh, for the next uh, half hour or so, we hope that you, you listen, uh, you learn. And, and more importantly, uh, if you have a question at the bottom of the screen, you can type in a question and we'll uh, hopefully get to, to, to your question or your subject uh, uh, sometime tonight. So I'd like to introduce Paul Pearl, who's uh, uh, in charge of uh, the player development process for uh, Mass Hockey. Paul? Uh, thanks, Roger, and uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in this evening, and it gives us a great opportunity just to speak to you about uh, the process and what we hope is uh, a process that, you know, develops all the best players in Massachusetts moving on to the National Festival. So I guess just to, a lot of you were part of this process last year, so you have a general understanding of it. Just to give you a little background, this is my fourth year um, as, as the person heading it up. And um, we've had great successes, I think, in terms of getting to the right players who moved on to Buffalo. But we've also had great successes in trying to make um, the festival something memorable for the kids who don't move on to um, Buffalo and the tryout process being something that everyone feels like they got a fair shake. And, you know, I know sometimes you're going to feel like that's not true. But what I can tell you is, is it's our goal and the reason we hire such good evaluators um, our goal to get the best players to move through each stage. And just to remind you, again, I know a lot of you did this last year, but it starts with a tryout. Uh, everybody in Massachusetts in the age group is eligible to do it. Uh, they get 90 minutes on the ice. From there, we break it down to uh, four 20-team teams or uh, basically a final 80. Out of that, we run – that's four games that the kids get to play. And then the following weekend, we have three more um, skating opportunities in the uh, All-Star weekend. So – any kid who gets picked to go on and, and play um, in Buffalo and then hopefully move on to a team such as the Holenka uh, will have played seven different times in front of the evaluators. And you can go online, uh, the Massachusetts hockey website, and see who the different evaluators I have, but basically made up of Division One assistants, uh, professional scouts, and uh, a couple of Division Three head coaches. So we're very confident in the people that are putting eyes on your sons and on, in order to uh, move on in the process. Paul, thank you for that, and 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 certainly I want to just uh, reinforce something that uh, that Paul said. It, when, when we do tryouts in in all our regions, certainly in Massachusetts, and then we do our tryouts in our national camps uh, for for players to represent our country, um, it, it's a snapshot in time. Uh, and and if, if if for some reason or another you're not ready at that moment, that does not mean that you're not going to be ready down the road. That that really falls in your hands as a player. And we're going to talk about that tonight, but I want you to understand that, that being told no, or being told that you're not good enough is a very, very, very common situation for a lot of our players. In fact, when kids come to our national camp at 15, only 20% of those players go from the 15, 16 and 17 camp. There's an 80% turnover from year to year. I've coached our Holinka team, which is the best, 17 year olds in the country, which this age group that we're talking to tonight would be eligible for that team next summer. And, and I will tell you that when we go from year to year to pick that team, and again, it's the best players in, in the world that we're competing against from Russia and Sweden and Finland and Canada, that over half the team from the year before from the five nations at 16 doesn't make it again the next year. It's usually about 30% of the kids make it year to year. And, and what that speaks to is your physical development, your physical maturity, your mental maturity, where you're at right now is just a snapshot in time. So we're going to give you some information, hopefully tonight, that helps you make some good decisions as you move forward to help you with your this process and to give you, for lack of a better term, give you some answers to the test. The, the question to you as a player is, are you willing to use them? Okay. And so... Some of you may have seen this before. Some of you may have not. And, and this is basically the yellow uh, bars, the age that you're at right now. And, and, and all the boxes previous to where you're at right now, the suppleness, which is your athleticism, the skill window, the early speed window, speed one, we're always going to work on athleticism. We're always going to work on skills. The best players in the world are constantly working in those two areas. They're constantly working on their quickness and their lateral movement. 
But the major focus for players that we're talking to tonight is the decisions and the things that you do away from the rink. And I'm not talking about decisions socially. I'm talking about decisions in training. And, and I think the biggest mistake that's made by young athletes is they look for shortcuts in training and their focus is really on the games and what team they're on and who they're playing with and who they're playing against and my rankings. And I can tell you right now, when we pick a kid to wear our, our colors, to wear the red, white, and blue, or the two college coaches are on our call tonight, when they pick players to play for their, their great universities and their great hockey programs, they don't care where you play. They want to know if you're going to help them. They're only going to take you if they think you, they can, you can help their program. And there's a lot of factors that come into play with that. So I want the players to understand a couple things. One, you're responsible for your development, not your coaches, not your parents. They'll help create the environment. They'll help get you there. They'll help, you know, obviously with some of the, the cost and other things that you can't control. But you are in total control of your development. You're responsible for your development. And, and uh, what I see a lot of players is that they don't take responsibility and you have to. The best players in any sport are self-starters. They are the ones that don't, the coaches don't have to look over their shoulder. The coaches don't have to tell them what to do. The coaches don't have to constantly be on them. They're the ones that are coming to the coaches and asking for what can I do now? Where's the holes in my game? What do I need to get better at? So it's really important that you understand that the responsibility for development is yours. And secondly, that training, 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 not games, not tournaments, not showcases, but the training and the time. What you put in is what you're going to get out. And I see so many young athletes look for shortcuts. It's not going to happen. Listen, I can sit in the locker room next to the best players in the world. They're not going to make me better players. I'm going to make myself better players. In fact, if you're going to move on as an athlete, you're not going to move on as a team. You're going to move on as an individual. Okay. And so you got to understand that that's really important. Okay. Training model versus competition model. We just touched on them a little bit, but I'd like to reach out to Paul Pearl, who's been an unbelievable college hockey coach in this region for a long time and had a lot of success and has worked with some phenomenal athletes. I want you to talk about uh, the difference between the, the, the good players you've had and the great players you've had and, and their focus on, on the training compared to the competition piece. Well, I think you, you definitely have kids who um, take advantage, say, of all that uh, BU has to offer with our strength coach and our weight room and all that. But it's kind of a matter of who puts the most into it. Like you can certainly be uh, there and not necessarily competing as hard as you can. And when kids get to our level, it's those guys that really understand that, all right, I've, I've made it this far. This wasn't a destination. This is just a stop off on the way. I want to get better off ice. I want to get better on ice. I want to get better in my understanding of the game. Those are guys who, who, who go at it the hardest for us and have kind of that innate competitiveness that, that you, you just talked about, the guys who are the self-starters that can, can really get themselves to a certain level. Ryan, how about some of the things, some of the characteristics you see as far as just the compete level and the, and the, the attitude that some of the top goaltenders you've worked with over the over the years, and uh, also the other athletes that you're on the ice with uh, consistently at, at Harvard? Yeah, I mean, obviously, once you get to that level, Division One, whether it be BU, Harvard, or wherever else, I mean, obviously, you've done a good enough job to that point to prove yourself to play there, but then once you get there, it's it, no one cares what you've done in the past, it's what can you do then, so... There's a common thing I always tell my goalies and I, I even tell the players over at Harvard as well is you need to prove yourself every day. You know, like uh, look at Marty Brodeur. He played till he was like 85 years old and he ended up leaving to the Jersey Devils and went to the St. Louis Blues and he had to continue to prove himself every day. So it, once you get to the team, once you make your high school varsity roster, once you make it to you, you make your top junior league team, you make it to the division one college hockey, you got to continue to prove yourself every day. And to kind of go along again with the question, like you got to compete every day in practice. You can't just go through practice and go through the motions and expect come game time, you're just going to flip a switch and, and boom, there's your competitiveness. You need, to, you need to do it every day. And I just want to reemphasize the thing that's holding back the Northeast when it comes to developing a large, large pool of elite talent and, and guys that represent our country on, on 
world junior teams, Olympic teams on, on, uh, you know, five nations team, Olympic teams is there's this over, over, over emphasis on the competition piece and we're missing the training piece. And I beg of you, if you want to move on in the sport, you've, you've got to, you've got to really dig in deep in that area. Okay. Because to me right now, you guys are a little bit past this, this fork, but I always tell 14, 15 year old players, you're at a fork in the road in your development. And, and one path is you just want to play hockey. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Listen, there's a lot of people out there that play hockey for the rest of their lives. It's a great sport. It's the greatest sport on the planet. And, and it's a lifelong sport for a lot of us. But if, if down deep you have a burning desire to really be a good hockey player, that's a completely different path. And, and there's a lot of things that come into play that we're going to talk about tonight that you have to have in your, in your duffel bag of tricks uh, in order to get you to that level. So to me, there's completely two different paths here and you got to be completely committed uh, to the right path because I know a lot of guys that take a lot of shortcuts and it catches up to you at some point or another. Uh, so tonight the discussion is you just want to play or do you want to be really good? Uh, and again, that's two different, two different, uh, doorways. Okay. Well, you want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you see your athletes do that are really important, especially some stuff they can do during this downtime. Yeah. I just picked three quick exercises here. Obviously our guys do a ton, but three quick ones, um, that you could be doing during a pandemic at home, even if you didn't have the equipment, this is a simple one-legged box jump. Uh, you could use your stairs in your yard, uh, anything that obviously you jump up, but developing kind of that power that you're going to utilize when, when you're skating. Then the second one we have here is just uh, one-legged skater hops. Um, again, we, we, there's equipment there, obviously it's a weight room, but if you're at home you stick a piece of wood in between you, you could uh, go up and over a bench, uh, but you're working on your power, your strength. Yeah, I mean, that is a hockey stride right there. And also your balance on, on landing. So very, very good exercise. And, uh, whether or not you're, you're, you're able to get into a gym, you can still do it. And then here, again, you don't necessarily have to have equipment. You could be using uh, plywood, whatever you have in your yard, two by fours, uh, but three different quick exercises, about 100 you could do off this. We did the quick feed over. Now we did some lateral runs through the middle, and then we're going to finish up with um, just some two-legged hops. Okay, all kind of developing core power, trying to get kids stronger. Uh, so things that will then get you playing well in a game, all these things can be developed while you're at home here during this uh, terrible time. Paul, oh, Brian, have you guys ever sat around the coaching room and said, looked at each other and said, that guy is just way too athletic and he's way too skilled? No, no sir. That has never, <laughs> ever, ever happened. No, and I don't think it ever will happen. So the <laughs> message to the athletes is, if you want to be athletic and you want to be skilled, you have to put the time in because there is no such thing as a guy that's too skilled and there's no such thing as a guy that's too athletic. There's a lot of players that aren't really smart. There's a lot of guys that are deficient athletic, athletically and skill-wise, but there's never never heard anybody ever say this guy's got too much of one of those two things. Right, 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 right. Here's some other things, and, and, and we'd like you to think outside the box a little bit. Be creative with some of the stuff that you're doing, okay? Uh, it doesn't take – you don't have to have a, a specialized gym. You don't have to have a, the, the most glamorous setup in the world. Um, you know, get yourself outside your box. Stretch yourself a little bit. You know, don't stay in your comfort zone. Don't do what you already do well, okay? Do, work on what you don't do well. Um, and, and be creative with your training. Have some fun with it. You know, don't make it a full-time job. Find a, a, a sibling or a friend or, or a parent that's going to, you know, kind of do some things that, that simulate the game. Put yourself in game-like situations. Put yourself in conflict. You know, don't, don't just make it easy. Um, because practice and training is for getting better, not for just re reinforcing what you already do well. Okay? Um, and, and I'll tell you this, that the best players I've been around – this is part of their daily routine. I, I know I, we have friends that, that coach with the Penguins, and I know when, when the, the Pittsburgh built their new practice facility, Crosby made them put in shooting tunnels, and he shoots over 1,000 pucks a day. You're talking about one of the best players in the world. There's a reason why he's one of the best players in the world. He continues to be because he works at his craft on a daily basis. Just doesn't wake up and become Sidney Crosby. He works at it every day, and that, that's really important for the athletes to understand that. 
So development happens every day. The decisions you make away from the rink. Paul, I'd like you to talk a little about what you think that means, maybe even beyond the training piece uh, for the athletes that you're involved with. Well, I think especially the age you're hitting, you know, you're starting to go through puberty. You're starting to hit high school here with the old fours and certainly some uh, grown up issues become part of what used to be just a little kid's life. And, you know, you, you got to stay away from alcohol. You got to stay away from drugs. You have to eat well, what you put in your body matters. You have to sleep well, you know, you, you got to take care of yourself. And, and these are kind of all life decisions that you're going to make. You know, no one, no one should define themselves as a hockey player. If anything, even the best hockey players, they, it's the type of person they are and, and what hockey develops, the type of character they develop. And part of that is maybe, you know, when your friends are out there doing something stupid, uh, staying away from that and, and avoiding it and trying to be, you know, a good person and, and a leader amongst your group, not a follower and, and somebody that, you know, take it to the next step with recruiting, someone that can be trusted and someone that a coach is going to want in his locker room for four years. Paul and Brian, Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about coachability? Like the, the athletes you work with, uh, um, how important is, is their ability to listen and, and then translate and, and implement? It's huge. Um, I mean, the biggest thing, especially for the goaltenders, since there's only there's so few of them compared to, compared to the players, is is the relationship. So if, if a kid's not coachable, if a kid's not going to listen, if he's not going to be willing to try new things, then it, it's going to be impossible to establish a relationship. And then it's almost going to be a waste of time trying to coach the kids. So, I mean, with any coach, there's I mean, if, if you're a coach that says there's it's this way or the highway, then. I disagree with that completely, but as a, as a player, especially at a younger age, or once you get into, you know, higher levels, junior college, you have to be coachable. You have to be willing to try new things and you have to be willing to listen. If you're not, you're, you're really just hurting yourself and basically hindering your overall development. Yeah. I think it's interesting in coaching our national teams. Um, I can tell the players on, on the call and the parents that, that I've worked with uh, eight or nine of our national teams over the last, you know, couple of years. And, and the number of kids that we made mistakes on, <laughs> it's, it's frightening um, that went on to become great players. And, and part of it was because, it, it, you know, at the moment that they were in, they just weren't the biggest, the strongest, the fastest. But I would tell you that every one of those guys had high end character, had high end compete level and were extremely coachable. And they took, they took the, the, um, the, 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 the moment in their life where they, they got, they felt like they maybe were unjust, unjustly not picked that they, they believed in themselves, their confidence, having confidence is critical, but they felt somebody missed them. They didn't feel sorry for themselves. They didn't run and hide. They use it as, as momentum to build their career and build their path because the best players I've ever been around. And I'm sure you guys can attest to this as well. They all had failure, but the failure didn't crush them. The failure actually made them stronger. Can you talk a little bit about some, maybe some guys, you don't have to use names, but some guys that, that you watched play when they were these guys' age at 16 as a recruiter, and you're like, ah, that guy can't play. And then all of a sudden he's coaching, you're playing and coaching against him or, or you know, he's, you're coaching him, um, and you just, wow, this guy is really special. Right. I, I think the, you know, the story that comes up all the time, and again, without using the name, is um, there's one kid I know that played on the Olympic team that didn't make the national festival as a 15-year-old. And, you know, playing in the NHL right now, local kid, that wasn't because the evaluators were wrong that year. It was just because he wasn't ready to take that next step. Now, what happens with a lot of kids is they come on later, and, and then they come on even harder than the other kids. So... I feel like everybody needs to know that a with our trial process, is it perfect? No. I mean, we have humans, but we do try to do our best to get the right people in there making the decisions. And it is all based upon who we think is going to go to Buffalo and do the best and, and have the best opportunity to succeed there. But just because you weren't picked that as you know, your, your first year, Maybe even not your second year. You still make it as your third year and end up being the best player in the age group. Happens all the time. Talk a little bit about guys, because we have this group of, of, you know, all fours on the call and they're a little bit older now. Talk about social media real quickly and, and, and the, the message you give to your athletes. And, and question for you, when you recruit a kid, do you look into his, 
into his background uh, uh, with a little Google search or, or the social media search. So back in the day, it would always be, you know, when you, you tell your team, right, Roger, I'm sure you can equate with this is, um, you know, when, you, when you're going out at night on Saturday after a game up at UVM or at Brown or whatever, you know, don't wear any of your Brown or UVM jacket or anything and don't do anything stupid that would embarrass the program that would, um, you know, be against the law or anything like that. That now has been taken over to social media. Don't do anything that would embarrass you, the program, your family or anybody else. Um, you know, basically don't use it as an area of controversy. Like if you, it's nothing wrong with having friends and having fun on social media. It's great. But I'll just tell you, if you do anything stupid on there, um, I'm not sitting there telling you that I just scrolled through guys' Instagram accounts, but we have people who do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so we know these things when a kid comes to us. So if we're going to recruit you, part of the check we do on you is background and it is the different social media accounts that you have and, and what you might've been doing on them. Cause it's important to us. Cause that, that's what other people are going to see. Yeah. And I think the message to the athletes for sure is that the decisions you make away from the rink in today's world can stay with you forever. So no just, just make good ones and make smart ones and, and do the right thing. Um, talk a little bit about guys about talent versus effectiveness. Cause, cause we do watch a lot of kids that have talent. Um, and, and, and they might, they might, I, I kind of call some of these guys combine freaks. Like they, they're really fast. They could be really strong. They look good going around cones and skating circles and warm up. Um, but when it comes into the day, are they effective? Could you talk a bit about the difference between talent versus effectiveness for their athletes? Robo, you want that one to start? I've been doing all the talking. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try not to butcher it again, but there's the, <laughs> the whole, the old saying that uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, you know? So again, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. Uh, you got to make sure you're proving yourself every day in practice. And I mean, you know, talent only takes you so far, you know, I mean, you might be born with some, some nice hands. You might be born with a quick glove. You might be born with some good feet, but you got to work on being a uh, well-rounded player. You know, you can't just be one dimensional. You got to be able to play all 200 feet as a player, as a goaltender, you got to be able to play in all situations, whether you're playing on the top team, the worst team, middle of the pack, you get, you got to be able to play really at any level in any situation. Yeah. And, and for me, I just feel like, you know, uh, um, talent as the funnel gets smaller becomes less of a differentiator. I think you can dominate, you know, when you're 12, 13, even 14 years old, talent size, you know, basically you've developed quicker as a person or hit puberty earlier than other kids. As you get older, and that talent starts to blend out. Now desire, heart, um, you know, just a lack of willingness to lose battles and, and be strong. Those are the guys that are effective. Second thing is guys knowing themselves, right? So, um, you know, if you're a good, strong, puck-moving defensive defenseman, don't get into a tryout situation and try to make yourself into Bobby Orr. You know, and same thing, if you're a good two-way center, you know, we know that. I mean, yeah, do you need to get some points if you're a forward? Absolutely. But we're not looking for you to score three goals each of the tryout sessions. We're looking to see you play your game and, and play both ends of the ice. So I think the effective kids are the guys who know themselves too, Roger, like the guys who kind of understand what their game is and while still working on their faults um, are, are really grinding out to, to accentuate what their positives are in a tryout situation. Well, along those lines, let's give the answers to the test to these guys. They come, they come through the trial process next year for mass hockey. They're trying to move into the, the final group. They're trying to move themselves into the all-star game and possibly move on to the national camp for USA hockey to represent mass. What are some of the things you're looking for? Well, for me, I mean, hockey sense is kind of the number one thing. I, I, I certainly think a kid who can think his way around the rank can make himself effective in a first line role or a fourth line role. You know what I mean? Whatever, might be asked for if he's playing for a team that's, you know, going to the Halenka tournament. Um, I think obviously speed, uh, but not everybody has to be the fastest guy on the ice. That'd be impossible, but for the guy who gets the most out of his speed. So that's doing the off ice stuff, making himself more explosive. So he's quick enough. And then I think, you know, just strength um, overall, like the guys who, you know, can win a one-on-one -on -one battle, play defense, be on the right side of the puck, do things well without the puck. You know, those are the guys I think that are most effective 
at all levels and especially when you get to the higher levels like playing in the national festival ryan anything to add uh, yeah definitely um i mean from the goaltending side of things as coach pearl likes to say if the, the guy stops the most pucks but um on a serious note, you know, the things I'm, that we're looking for, the, you know, the, myself and the staff is, you know, number one, we need kids that can skate. You can't skate. You can't move. I mean, same thing applies to players. You can't play the game. You're not going to be able to keep up. I mean, with all the rule changes, the way that the direction the game's going so much faster, there's more cross slot passes. There's double cross slot passes. Like the, the kids that are sliding all over the place, down on their knees, playing from the butterfly, it, it's just not effective style anymore. You, you can't play like, you know, J.S. Chaguerre. I'm sure a lot of the kids that are hearing that name might not even know who he is. But if you go back to the early, mid-2000s, like he was considered one of the better goalies. If you try to play that style these days, you're going to be absolutely toast. So, I mean, after skating, as, as Coach Pearl already said, hockey IQ. I, I need a goalie that can read a play in front of him. And that combined with his footwork, put himself in the best position to make a save in, in any different situation. And then lastly, compete level. If these kids aren't competing for every single puck, no matter how out of position or no matter how less of a chance, little of a chance they think they have, we need those kids competing to the puck and then um, consistency. You know, we don't want a kid out there that's given up, you know, putting up a 33 shot shutout one night and then giving up seven, on, uh, three on 10 the next night. So those are, those are basically the short list of criteria we're looking for. Last question in this area and in, in, in particularly for tryouts, how about one or two things that have nothing to do with hockey that you're looking at? Well, I, I think are you talking about for the tryouts or for a kid I'd recruit at BU? Tryouts, but I think it goes both ways, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we want good kids. So if I'm going to send a kid from Mass out to the national festival and then he's going to get evaluated by those people and hopefully make those teams, he might not be good enough. He might, you know, be just right there and they need them right there. That's fine. What we don't want is something blowing back at us. That the kid's not a good kid. He was disrespectful to his team leaders. He was not, you know working hard in the practices. He was, had a bad attitude. He had bad body language. I mean, those things are very, very important and just as important, I think, as, as what kind of a hockey player he is. I mean, there was, there was one, I, I've been doing, like I said, I think at the beginning, four years. In year one, we had one group together. And for one of the age groups, it literally, we went for an hour on the final kid. I think we had, Kev, you could correct me. I think we had seven forward slots for that group. And that seventh kid, we had eight, we had eight guys for seven spots. And it was really those two. And it really came down to in the end, who we thought the better kid was. We just couldn't, we went back and forth, back and forth. And we're like, all right, this kid's a better kid. We know about him. We know that he'll be respectful out there. We know he'll be excited to represent mass. He'll be excited to do. It's not just another hockey tournament for him. It's just not another hockey event for him. He's a kid who is really excited about going out and having this opportunity. And, and, those things do become hugely important. Um, again, the older you get, the more these things become important. Awesome. So, guys, just also talking about um, practice and, and, and when you're in an evaluation in a short-term event, you certainly play to your strengths. You show what you got. Um, but the training piece that we've talked so much about tonight is working on what you don't do well and, and making sure that, that, that you're constantly – getting yourself out of your comfort zone, you're stretching yourself. You know, again, you're putting yourself in chaotic, you know, conflict that you're not doing drills that are predetermined. And the coach is telling you to turn left here, turn right there, then shoot there, that, that you're constantly being put in an environment where there's failure and you're dealing with it, and, but you're moving forward. Okay. And I think that's really critical when, when you're making decisions on, on how you train every day, don't, don't work on what you already do well. Um, work on what you don't do well and, and constantly get better because at some point that's going to become a factor in, in, in how what your ceiling is and how far you can go in this game. Uh, and so the training piece and, 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 and again, practice should be more difficult than the game. If your practices are not more, not so much physically, because that's got to be managed at your age because we want quality. We don't want just quantity. Just doing things to do things at your age makes no sense. You got to do it, do it right, do it well, and do it with a purpose. And and so um, it's critical that you're in an environment on a daily basis where you can um, uh, develop as an athlete mentally, cognitively, spatial awareness, physically, emotionally. Those are all really critical pieces of this. So 
So again, it's your responsibility to, 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 to find that environment and that culture and, and make sure you're doing it every day. I want you to all understand too, this is our national program based out of Plymouth, Michigan with the best 16 and 17 year olds in, in our country. Not all, but because some kids decide not to go there, but, but a lot of really good players. Obviously, I think there was nine first round draft picks from, from last year's group. So a pretty good, strong group last year, but um, 130 practices, 100 off ice sessions and only 50 games. And I think it's really important that you understand that when we compete against Finland and Sweden and the Russians and the Czechs and international play, our job is to win gold medals. So we need the best players possible. And USA Hockey is now considered one of the top countries in, in, in our sport. Uh, and that's taken a lot of work by a lot of really good people. But um, you got to understand what goes in, into it behind the scenes. And, and unfortunately here in the Northeast and particularly in Massachusetts, there's such a focus on the game part of it. And there's such a lack of focus on the training piece of it. We've got to get you guys that want to become great players. You got to try to hit those first two numbers. You have to, because it's not going to happen without it. So if you're not getting it with wherever you're at, you got to create it and you got to create it with another venue or on your own or somewhere, because that's what's going to change the, 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 uh, the path that you're on or, or the level that you get to the most is those first two numbers. It's critical. So I'd ask Paul and, 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 and Brian and Paul can go first. Like how many, how many training sessions, if you include team practice, individual skill sessions, off ice sessions with the strength coach, um, or somebody and, and along those lines and then video sessions where you're working on their reads and their decision making how many training sessions a week does a player have for you in college level uh, we'll have four practices leading into two games on the weekend we'll have two skill sessions which are optional but which about 80 percent of the kids take take part in so that's six uh, we'll watch video twice as a team each week um based on once off the previous weekend and once pre-scouting the following weekend. And then the, we'll have another individual video session with each player. So that gets us to 10. Um, and we do a yoga session, like a half of a yoga class each week on Tuesdays to stretch the guys out. So I'd say we're probably 11 different sessions in order to get to the two games on the weekend. So big commitment, obviously time wise, yeah. but energy wise as well. And, and Brian, how about the goaltenders? Like, Talk to me a little bit about what you're doing with those guys um, on an individual basis, the work that their development uh, on a weekly basis. Yeah. So kind of going off what Paul said, we usually have two video sessions a week. Um, our first video session is usually on the Monday or Tuesday after a weekend of games where we're going over the video from the games of the weekend prior. Um, then when we get on the ice, I'm on the ice twice a week over at Harvard as a volunteer. I can only get over there twice a week or four days a week if we have home games. Um, and usually the first day of the week is we're recreating some sort of situation we saw, uh, maybe a goal he struggled with, or maybe even wasn't a goal. It was just a scenario that he wasn't uncomfortable with, or I noticed the goal he wasn't uh, comfortable with. And then um, on Wednesday, we have another video session where all the goalies are invited, the ones that didn't play. We watch NHL clips. We watch other goalies. We watch the NHLers. We see what they're doing. Uh, we basically, it's, it's talk goalie shop. It's actually probably one of the things I enjoy the most about my job is being able to sit in a room with three collegiate goaltenders, all who are pretty good at stopping pucks and kind of just uh, pick each other's brains and have an open forum. So students of the game. hundred percent. Always. You have to be critical. Absolutely critical. Um, so just to kind of summarize for, for all the players and on the call here, some, some things that really hopefully that you took out of this tonight that, that you can take and, and implement and, and create and, and the culture and the environment that you put yourself in, is really, really important. It, it's not the end all be all, but it is critical. And that if, if you're, you know, if you're committed to doing things the right way, if you have the respect for the game and others, if you have passion and purpose, your mental toughness and your discipline is, is so critical because you're going to have some, some, some peaks and valleys and, and probably more valleys and peaks for, for all athletes uh, and, and, and anybody that wants to be special, it's not going to be an easy road. It's, it's difficult. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to watch the last dance with, with Michael Jordan, I mean, it, it's just amazing that he was cut from his, his high school team. He didn't make his high school team until he was a junior because he wasn't physically ready. And, and so, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, 
it's reality out there. Uh, you know, your practice habits, your coachability, the training, the nutrition, the rest. Again, what you're doing away from the rink. And, and what are you doing when nobody's watching? You know what? We can make a lot of excuses during this uh, tough times that were with all the rinks being closed, but everybody's in the same boat. So what's happening during your downtime when you're home can be a huge difference maker at the age that you're at. Um, this, this is my uh, uh, email address. This is my cell phone number. I'm the regional manager for USA Hockey for, for Massachusetts and New England. Um, certainly my goal is, is the same as everybody else on this call, and that's to have um, you know, uh, our national teams uh, be loaded with kids from Massachusetts. There's nothing better. And I can guarantee you, as a guy who coached in this region, college hockey for 20 years, and I'll speak for the two guys on the call from college they would certainly love to have a huge pile of Massachusetts hockey. There's some really talented kids here, but if we could just double that pool over the next 10 years, it'd be a game changer for everybody. Uh, but again, the responsibilities for, for the players on the call. Um, on behalf of USA Hockey, uh, you know, I, I wish that uh, uh, everybody's safe and, and gets through this uh, healthy and, and, and well. And I want to thank the guys that took the time to be on the call. I want to thank the, the parents for, for being on the call. And what we'll do here is I'll just look to see if there's one or two questions to kind of round this out. Um, uh, is there any, is there any during the season evaluation or is it all based on the, the 90 minute tryout? It's actually a really good question. Paul, you're on, you're on. You're on. You, Paul. I picked the evaluators in October uh, for who's going to pick in April. And they certainly aren't doing anything formal. They're not sending in reports to me or anything, but they know what age group they have. So they're certainly told to keep their eyes open for guys so that we do have some background information on people. So yeah, I guess the evaluation does go all year, uh, but still the most important thing is what they do the seven times they skate for us at the actual tryout. The best piece of advice I can give the players on the call is you never know which shift is going to either change your life positively or negatively. So you never know who's watching. You never know who's evaluating. And I can tell you at the age that you guys are at, somebody's always doing that. So don't take a shift off. Don't look for a shortcut. Give everything you got every time you step on the ice. Okay, that's a great, great, that's a really, really good question. And, and just one thing to add to that, Roger, um, you know, it's not, I think people feel like sometimes like we're bombarded with kids who have advisors or kids who have um, people that are doing the opinion making for us. That's just not true. We hire really, really high end evaluators. Uh, I'd like to think me and Robes have been around for a while. We know what we're doing and we certainly try to have, um, the best out for each and every kid of, of what they're doing and, you know, what the overall viewpoint of, you know, the hockey gurus at a certain age group or anything like that is, is not taken into consideration. That's great. I had another question here um, about the size of players and obviously guys that are, are, are bigger, stronger, faster, probably jump out a little bit more than some of the smaller guys. Um, I can just speak from, from my terms, uh, having picked national teams, um, you know, again, this is a, when you're being evaluated, it's, it's a, it's a moment in time, but I give me a guy who makes good decisions and good reads and competes consistently. And if he's got some passion, we can help him get stronger. We can help him get faster. I mean, I was fortunate enough to coach maybe one of the best small players in the history of the game and Marty St. Louis and, Nobody wanted them for anything until, you know, I mean, Christ, he got waived from Calgary and he's a hall of famer. Um, but uh, it was because he was always told he was too small, but again, he used that as a chip on his shoulder to keep motivating himself to get better every day and to prove people that they were wrong. Um, but I'll tell you that, that, that you can't control that, but what you can control is the other stuff that we talked about tonight. So that that's a really important part of it. Right. You want to talk about that a little bit from a goaltending standpoint? Cause I know, there's a, always just a little bit of talk, and I was fortunate enough to coach another guy that was just barely six feet or below that guy named Timmy Thomas that there's been a lot of talk about recently when they're showing some of these clips about winning cups. 
talk about the size and, and the athleticism in the net. Yeah, Tibby Thomas, never heard of him. Um, I probably only have about five uh, pictures of him on the wall in my office. But uh, anyways, I think Timmy Thomas is a great example of, you know, there's no wrong way to stop a puck. I mean, obviously at the NHL level, they're, they're getting the biggest guys they can, or for the most part, we are seeing on average, um, it's going down a little bit. I know, I believe it was last season. I believe all major leagues, whether it was, it was involved junior, college, professional, uh, major junior. I don't think there was a goalie over six foot two that won a championship there. I know I've told multiple clients of mine that in the past. Um, but the big thing for me is it relates to size. Size is great. I'd be lying if I said, you know, if I get two kids, they're equally as good and one six foot and one six foot four. Yeah, odds are, especially the head coach is going to love the kid that's six four. But for me, at the end of the day, size is something that's out of every goalie's control. So I, I like to preach to those kids. You don't, don't waste any time, any energy on your size. You have no control over it. There's no workout you can do that I'm aware of. There's no supplement you can take that I'm aware of that's going to help you get taller. So the big thing that, again, I think a lot of coaches reiterate goalies and not goalies is you focus on what you can control. So, I mean, as far as size goes, I would prefer a kid that can compete his butt off every single shot and can skate faster than anyone out there over a kid that's six foot five and it's going to be sliding back and forth on his knees at all times. So we got two more questions I want to get to, and then we'll, we'll uh, let everybody go tonight. One of them, um, was uh is there this is for uh, kevin and and uh paul any plans for tryouts for this year for this age group or any age group this yeah no unfortunately uh based on usa hockey's recommendation like the rest of the other districts in uh usa hockey massachusetts canceled all of the uh spring tryout events uh my understanding roger is that the uh the 04 group um may or may not have a smaller version of a national camp that would be selected and uh, you're shaking your head. So I haven't heard that officially yet, but I kind of yeah, figured probably not. that cancellation was coming as well. Um, so unfortunately we miss out on that uh, entire process this season, which is, it's a shame. Uh, we enjoy doing it. It's a, uh, it's a few weekends over the course of the spring that we really enjoy. And uh, it's a great opportunity to see the players and to get the players a chance to skate with the best of the best eventually is our goal. So, uh, it's a shame, but uh, unfortunately, this season we're not going to be able to do anything um, related to that. So, and the last question I have, and this this one uh, hits home for me in particular, and and I'll, and I'll take it and run with it real quick is is are are we expecting specialization for a kid that's at this birth year? And I would say to you, no. Um, I would say to you that that the 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 training component becomes important. So the summer. And uh, the the um, off season, whenever that might be, needs to be go find somebody that knows what they're doing with an athlete. There's a lot of really good ones in 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 this region, um, and and because because every player is going to be different on where they're at physically, you know, and and where they're they're at in their growth period. Because you got to be really careful about what you do especially when you're talking about weight training and weight training has become a factor for this age group as you move forward for sure. Cause the only way you're going to get more explosive and quicker and faster and stronger is by putting the work in, but you got to put the right work in based on where you're at. So every kid's different. So we can't just put everybody in one pile. So find somebody that, that can look at you, can evaluate you and can then design something for you. If you go to usahockey.com or the mass hockey website, there's some great webinars that we put on. Over the last uh, month here, there's some great information on off-ice training, but there's also a lot of really good people in Massachusetts that understand this. And I would say to you that every athlete that has played on our Olympic team since we've gone to NHL players has been a multi-sport athlete. Not a single one of them was a hockey player only. They all played something else. And it translates not only in the athleticism piece, but in the leadership piece in the working with uh, other athletes and different looks. And, and there's also this little thing called burnout. That's a big factor for a lot of athletes at this age group. So, so to have some diversity in your background is really, really critical. And Raj, I'm going to jump real quick on that question as too, if I can, yep. only because I think uh, I'm reading the question as well. And it, it talks a little bit about the, the conflict that it has with our CCM high performance program. Um, you know, obviously there's a limited number of weekends by the time a high school season ends uh, and leading into the spring season for other athletes. It's, uh, it's not an easy process. We've tried to change that a little bit. Uh, most of you'll notice when we do our events, 
Uh, we try and schedule them um, for the tryout this year. It was going to be a Saturday and a Sunday. You had your choice of the two days. Hopefully, one, you know, if you're playing a baseball game on Saturday, you could make the Sunday tryout and vice versa. Um, same thing with the festival and Final Four. We try and schedule them later in the day on Saturday and then into Sunday. That doesn't alleviate all of the conflicts, but it hopefully it, it minimizes them to the best of our ability. And uh, again, it, in a perfect world, uh, you know, there'd be a, probably a better way to schedule it all. And we're hopeful that if we're asking for a couple weekends over the course of the springtime, that the spring coach maybe is flexible on that. Um, some are, some aren't. We know that MIAA has their you know, issues with the bona fide player rule and things of that nature, but we try and do our best to schedule them as, as accommodatingly as we can, and not everyone uh, gets that accommodation, but it's, it is not, not lost on us when we do put that schedule together. And the older you get, the more conflict there's going to be. Uh, it's, a, it's just the reality of the length of seasons and, and, and things like that. So there is going to be some tough decisions that have to be made at one point or another, but um, beyond that, I, I want to thank everybody for their time tonight. Uh, hopefully you picked up some information, um, and certainly reach out if you, if you didn't, then you can ask uh, any question you, that you want, um, using my cell phone or email, uh, and Kevin, you want to wrap it up? Well, I just want to thank everyone. I see you know, a good, great participation rate tonight. We had the, uh, 2005 group earlier tonight and now the 2004 group, um, hopefully this was beneficial to y'all, uh, a chance to get away from, uh, you know, life that as it's been crazy for the last uh, couple of months for all of us. And it's going to be probably that way for a little bit longer. So uh, hopefully there was some beneficial information shared here. We look forward to seeing you all come back uh, in the springtime next year and uh, use some of the information that you gathered here tonight to get yourselves ready for next year's tryout process. And we hope that we have, uh, as Paul said, the opportunity to send more and more kids out to the national camp. And uh, we want to see the mass kids continue to develop properly, but um some great information. I really appreciate everyone's participation and thanks to our panelists tonight, Roger, for leading the discussion and Brian and Paul, uh, you guys did a great job as well. And thank you very much and looking forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you, everybody. Be safe.